Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to the Northwood University Alumni Monthly Webinar Series. Um, welcome to all of our alumni and friends um, who are joining us today. Uh, I'm your host, Julia Damchek. Uh, today we're talking about cryptocurrency. What is it? Uh, how does it work? And should I buy it? Um, our presentation should last about 25 minutes today, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. Um, please use the Q&A chat function on the right-hand side of your screen. Type in your questions and we'll get to as many as we can um, after the presentation is complete. Um, we are recording today's webinar. Uh, we'll email it out to attendees afterwards along with a brief survey. Um, and today, our presenter is Dr. Peter Bush. Um, he is a professor of accounting and finance at our DeVos Graduate School of Management here at Northwood. Uh, he has over 20 years in the automotive and financial services industry, and he's been with us for, I think, over three years now. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Peter. Thank you, Julie. Much appreciated. So good afternoon, everyone, and I'm glad you could join today. So. Um, I'm, I'm Peter, I'm your friendly neighborhood finance guy. Um, so, you know, when, when we talk about the realm of finance, there's, there's a couple of topics that, that seem to ring um, uh, pretty heavily with, uh, uh, with students, with, uh, with alumni, with, 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 with pretty much everybody these days. And, and one of those is cryptocurrencies. And, and, and certainly that's changed a great deal um, over the past, um, I would say three to five years, but certainly over the past two years, um, you know, where it was a bit of a sidebar topic um, three, four, five years ago, where obviously, and we'll talk about the timeline of, of, of Bitcoin and some other cryptos, um, you know, where, where these coins have been around for a while, um, but they really didn't hit the, the public perception um, heavily, at least until maybe a couple of years ago. And now it, it seems to be coming common vernacular where people talk about cryptos and, and certainly even if you don't even know what a crypto is, um, the, the term or the word Bitcoin is, has kind of moved into our public vernacular and all of that. So, you know, so this is a big topic, right, from, from the cryptocurrency perspective, building out the kind of the structure of what it is, how we use them, all of that is, is a rather large topic. We don't have a, a great deal of time today. Um, so I'm going to scope it down as, as much as possible. And, and really, I would consider this a, a bit of a crypto 101 type of approach, uh, which is, if nothing else, if you, if you really don't have a handle on on you know what cryptos are, where they came from, how they function, all of that. Uh, you, you should certainly have that by the time you leave today. And, and to me, it's a good entry way <clears throat> into some more complex discussions about cryptos. And, and I allude to these a little bit, you know, later in this presentation. If you look at the overview, uh, in terms of you know what is the future of digital currencies, you know that's a bit up for for discussion at this point. Um, but 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 we'll touch on it a bit here as well. So so anyway, let's. Um, Let's start with the with the basics. <clears throat> so, you know, what 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 is a cryptocurrency to begin with, right? Cryptocurrency is, is essentially a, a digital or virtual currency, right? It's a currency that is, that exists and lives in digital form, right? Rather than the dollar bills you pull out of your pocket or something of that nature, uh, uh, cryptos are are digital by nature, uh, and they are uh, they are secured by something called cryptography, um, and we'll talk a bit about that. But that's where the name cryptocurrency comes from. Is their, is their cryptography um, backdrop or the structure in which they're built. Uh, so some of the key aspects of these cryptocurrencies, um, once again, they are a form of digital asset that's, uh, that's based on a network that's a distributed network. I'm gonna go through that in a little bit when we talk about blockchain and how, how the underlying backdrop of blockchain works. Um, but essentially it is a, it's a digital asset that is traded through a network. Um, I've already mentioned that the cryptocurrency is de derived from the encryption techniques that are used uh, to, to develop and, and design it. Uh, there are different types of uh, cryptocurrency uh, encryption techniques that are used. Um, you know, this is not an IT uh, discussion, so we're not going to dive too, too deeply into the specifics of, you know, public and private key pairs or, or hashing functions or anything of that nature. Uh, but what I will do is there, right in the middle of this, we're going to talk about how blockchain works. And, and I'll give you kind of a 10,000 foot view of how that functions in terms of the, the structure of, of that type of, type of backdrop. And I think, I, I think most people know now, even if you've never bought a crypto in your life, uh, that cryptocurrencies are held in what are called digital wallets. 
Um, I think, unfortunately, uh, many people know about that because of the issues that have occurred at uh, multiple digital wallets over the years, including places like Mt. Gox and, and, and the past. So we'll, we'll touch on some of those things, but simply put, right, cryptocurrencies are, are, are simply a currency that lives in digital form, but, um, but serves as a currency, uh, aka like the US dollar. <clears throat> I'm not going to walk through every bullet on here um, because it'd be a bit much, especially for a short presentation. But uh, the history of cryptocurrencies go be goes back quite some time. So as I said, even though it's become more of a, of a buzz topic in the last couple of years, um, cryptocurrencies have been around quite a bit longer than that. Um, stepping back to in, in 1983, um, uh, a person named uh, David Shalm uh, developed the cryptogra uh, cryptographic system. Uh, that's used as the backdrop, um, and he called it eCash at the time. So that's really where the technique, crypt cryptog cryptography, <laughs> say that word five times fast, cryptography came from. Uh, it was back in 1983. Uh, it was it was brought into the public domain in, in terms of being a, a, a usable, tradable uh, cryptocurrency in, uh, in 2008, and really in 2009 when trading began with Bitcoin. So as I mentioned before, right? If, if most people that that talk about or touch on cryptocurrencies generally bring up Bitcoin first because it is, um, you know, really the 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 first mainstream viable cryptocurrency. Uh, so it's been around the longest, 2009 being when it started trading, um, and it's also become a bit of the pseudonym for the entire structure of cryptocurrencies, meaning that. You know, people use the term Bitcoin to talk about cryptos in general, but Bitcoin is just one of many cryptos, and, and we'll talk about that uh, as we move forward here. Um, some of the others that that uh, people have heard of, like Ethereum, which came around in, in, in 2015, Coinbase as well in, in 2015, uh, and really, you know, into 2016 and such, we started to see um, cryptocurrencies becoming um, more practical, at least to some degree in the market. Um, and just to put it in perspective now, um, there are over 11,700 cryptocurrencies in circulation at the moment. Actually, it's a little higher than that right now, uh, with a market cap somewhere around 2.1 trillion. That, that, those spe that specific data is about a month old, and it's a rapidly changing market, but it's, it's somewhere in that, in that vicinity. So really quickly, just a snapshot of the cryptocurrencies that are that are in circulation. Once again, there's over 11,000 of them. So I had no uh, uh, grand mission of putting 11,000 cryptocurrencies up here on the screen. But this is just a, a quick snapshot of the top. I guess I, I captured set, top 17 here. Um, you know, if you want to dive a little deeper into that and look at some of the data in terms of each of these cryptos, uh, which includes things like their value currently, their market cap, all of that. Uh, there's a really good website called uh, CoinMarketCap, which you can see the uh, link at the bottom here. So CoinMarketCap.com. And there's a, a lot of information uh, out there about all these cryptocurrencies. And even if you want to know something as simple as how many are in existence right now, if you go at the CoinMarketCap, it has a running uh, total on the top of how many currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies are currently in existence. If you look down this list, there, there's a number of cryptos that, uh, number one, either people know about, like Bitcoin, which is number one. Uh, I mentioned Ethereum, which is number two. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of others here, uh, including things like Dogecoin, which you know, kind of made uh, came to the public perception, I, I think, uh, largely because of Elon Musk. Right? And so there's, there's, there's a number of these that are, that are in play. Litecoin went number 15. So obviously, we don't have the time to dive into each of these here. But we're going to talk about the, the backdrop of, of what these are, how they function as we go forward here. So the first thing I want to do is, is really at the stage, um, kind of stepping away from using Bitcoin as a replacement for what, you know, the total market of cryptocurrencies, but rather look at the categories of cryptocurrencies because they're not all the same, right? There are three major categories of what we would call cryptocurrencies. The backdrop structure then of them is a bit different. We're gonna start with decentralized, right? Which is this first um, structure here. That is where you can plug in Bitcoin because Bitcoin is a decentralized cryptocurrency. Uh, what does that mean, right? It means that they don't have a centralized structure, right? These these currencies are not linked to a government, so they're not U.S. dollar, uh, they're not U.S. government backed or um, uh, Chinese government backed or anything of that nature. But rather, they exist in space in the market within the network uh, and are a true decentralized crypto. 
Uh, and once again, Bitcoin is probably the best representation of that. Um, the second category are called stable coins. Uh, so, so stable coins are a little bit different than decentralized in that stable coins value is pegged to something else. When I say pegged to something else, it means they're linked directly to, to something else, whatever it may be. So you could create, you know, a digital coin that trades and you could link it to something like a commodity for it. Or you could link it to the U.S. dollar and say, okay, well, we're linking the uh, you know, digital U.S. dollar, which is, would be a stable currency linked to the physical U.S. dollar, right? Uh, so that's what a stable coin is, whereas a decentralized cryptocurrency doesn't have anything behind it, right? There's no link. A stable coin has a link, a, a, a peg to something. And really as, you know, as fintech, and when I use the term fintech, I'm talking about financial technology, as fintech continues to accelerate, uh, as this market continues to evolve and mature a bit, um, there's a lot of different types of stable coins that have been uh, that have been created. Once again, we don't have enough time to dive deeply into them here, but certainly I think you know it's it's the subject matter of another discussion of the, of this type. That's the second category, and the third are um, C, uh, CDBGs, uh, BBs, sorry, uh, which are central be uh, bank digital currencies. What these are simply are uh, digital currencies that are um, sponsored and launched and supported by a government. Uh, so uh, something like a, U a digital U.S. dollar, if, if it existed, which it doesn't at the moment, would be one of these. Um, China has launched a pilot with uh, with their currency um, in, in 2021, so earlier this year. Uh, they, they started to pilot that in a couple major markets within China uh, with, uh, with the intention of, of trying to capture that um, that market um, as well. Uh, the European Central Bank has talked about this. So there's there's a number of these that are that are in play. And as we get later in this presentation, we'll, we'll, as we talk about the future, we can talk about how each of these uh, categories plays into that. I want to spend a few minutes talking about blockchain because because I think the even bigger discussion here we could we could have an entire uh, lecture on, on blockchain itself and just take cryptos out of this, right? Because blockchain is the underlying technology that, that supports Bitcoin. So we'll just step off of and, and continue to, to work off of Bitcoin. Uh, so let's talk about blockchain because the, the, the real positive attributes of blockchain um, is that it can be used for a number of different things outside of just a cryptocurrency. And that's where the real power of this technology is. So what is it, right? Blockchain is simply a chain of blocks that contains information. That's kind of your basic Webster dictionary uh, definition of what it is. But it's essentially a technique uh, that was developed in the early 90s uh, that's, that's, that was intended at the time to digitally timestamp documents, right? So that way you could create digital documents that had the same type of digital timestamping and tracking that you could get with a physical document. Right. And we still live in a, in a largely physical document world in, in certain cases, like trying to you know, apply and, and, and close a mortgage or something of that nature, where you're still physically signing reams of uh, reams of physical paper. Uh, this type of technology has the the ability to step into that space. Right. So this technology has been around since the early 1990s, as I mentioned. It wasn't used much until Satoshi Nakamoto used it for Bitcoin in 2009. And, and really, that's when not only did cryptos become um, a known commodity, uh, but blockchain become, became a known technology. And that's where all of these things began to, uh, to step out into um, what is the common speak now, right? And so it's changed a bit. So a blockchain is a dis digitally distributed ledger that is completely open, right? One of the major benefits of blockchain, blockchain technology, and especially if we look at it in the scope of Bitcoin is that it is an open network, right? Meaning that you can, if you, if you are trading Bitcoin, if you're using Bitcoin as a currency, you can see within that network every transaction that's happening, right? Compare that to a traditional currency now where most of the transactions of traditional currencies, whether it's US dollar or the Euro or whatever, are going through commercial banks, Right. Well, these are closed ledgers. These are private ledgers and you can't see them. So there's a lot of things that happen with the U.S. dollar moving every day that you as a person cannot see because all these movements are happening through banks and bank networks where with something like Bitcoin, you as a user of this, um, in this case, a currency, 
um, can see all of the transactions that are occurring, right? So an interesting and really powerful property of, um, of these blockchains is that once data has been recorded inside the chain, it can be very, very difficult to change it. There's a number of reasons for that. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but at the end of the day, this chain and the information in it is distributed across various networks. So in order to, to do something in terms of tamper with a chain, you have to find a way to effectively tamper with the entire chain that's been distributed across all these networks without someone catching the fact that you're tampering with that chain. And that is, is, a, is a major hurdle across. So when you think about blockchain, and I actually have a visual coming up, but there are three components to a blockchain. The first is the data, whatever it may be, right? We're gonna focus on Bitcoin in a minute. The second is the hash of the block, right? Which is, which is essentially a fingerprint, right? Every block has its own hash, just like every human has their own fingerprint. And the third is the hash of the previous block, right? So let's take a look really quickly at this. This is a, a simplistic uh, schematic example of what a blockchain looks like, three blocks in the chain. But essentially what you can see, the important points of this, of, this, of this chain, our block number one is in this case what we call the genesis block. The genesis block is the very first block in a chain, meaning there's only one, one genesis block in any chain. So way back in 2009 in January, the genesis block of, of Bitcoin was created. And that is the block at which all other blocks link back to through the chain. If you look at the, um, the hash and the previous hash under the physical blocks, Right, you can see how the block ties together, right? Every block has its own hash, right? So for block number one, that little yellow cloud, that 2Y9T is the hash of block number one, right? And that is the fingerprint or physical identifier of that block. So anytime, so that's transaction number one, that's the Genesis block of a new transaction. So let's say that I, I was part of the Genesis block and then I was using the Bitcoin that I had from Genesis block to purchase something with and creating block number two. So a new block is created, which is block number two, which has its own unique hash, which is in that little green cloud, that 7X1S um, number, right? That is the hash of the, ex the, the new block, which is block two, but that block also contains the hash of the prior block, right, which is in the yellow cloud. So these, so where blockchain comes into play is these blocks are chained together via these hashes, right? So you can trace back every transaction via these hashes, right? That is the power of the chain, right? The chain is built out in this, in this manner. In other words, a block only fits into the chain if it refers back to a prior block and has the proper linkage back to it. And you can see that through the schematic. So why does that matter, right? What makes that so secure? Right, so once again, 10,000 foot level, um, this line of blocks through the hash system, uh, the, really the chain itself is what makes it secure because the chain has to tie together. Uh, the unique hash that's created uh, creates a degree of security. Uh, there's a proof of work mechanism in place that I don't have time to get into today, but it slows down the creation of the blocks to, to verify that any transaction, i.e. any new block that's created fits appropriately into the chain. Also, this distribution of this block across uh, across a peer-to-peer -peer network is part of that supporting structure. So I'm gonna step through, just real quickly, if you look at this, this slide, the power of, the, of, of blockchain technology is that there are applications across all kinds of different areas, including financial services, et cetera, from smart contracts, from a digital notary system, from collecting taxes, and many, many, many other things. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna dive into the digital future a bit and really kind of focus back on cryptos. Uh, because that is the main topic here. Um, so as we look at the pros and cons of, of a digital currency future, in other words, if we look to what happens, not tomorrow, but five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years down the road, you know, what is the benefit of moving away from a physical uh, structure like we have now, or really, if you think about it, with having banking and commercial banks as the kind of the centerpiece of our current currency system, some of the benefits, so faster payments are certainly possible because it's digital. Uh, less expensive international tra uh, transfers are possible, 24 seven access, of course. Um, one of the big ones, which I don't have the time to talk about here so much, but I really would like to do a separate higher discussion on it, is the support for the unbanked and the underbanked. I think most people are probably unaware that there's over a billion people on this planet 
that don't have access to banking at all. And if you don't have access to banking, you do not have access to the, the, the current market system. And so onboarding a billion people into the, into, the, into the structure of our market system would be a tremendous uh, um, impact, not only on the system themselves, but specifically to the people that are being onboarded. Right, and so there's a major benefit there in terms of supporting the unbanked and underbanked. Um, some of the disadvantages, and some of these are, I would say, more recent than future. Right now, there's too many currencies to navigate. Uh, as I mentioned, there's, there's over 11,000 currencies out there right now. That that is not a go forward state. So that you know, it's it's a newer market. It needs to mature. There's things that need to change in it. We'll see that happen as well. Um, some of these others clearly stick out, like large swings in digital currency prices. Um, it seems that every time you know Bitcoin moves a little bit, um, you know th there's all kinds of talk about you know the the pros and cons and what's going on with Bitcoin and is there a future and all of that. You know within the last week, uh, you had Jamie Dimon, who is the CEO of of JP Morgan, come out and say, ah, Bitcoin's not really worth anything in the future. To the contrary, you had Fidelity come out, I think it was yesterday or two days ago, and say that they see Bitcoin trading at somewhere around 100,000 uh, a year from now. Right, those are those are really diametrically opposite types of positions, but it's quite interesting because they, these are people that are in the know or, or companies that are in the know that aren't quite sure, you know, what you know what the future holds. And I think that's where we stand: is what does the future hold? Uh, you know, the argument for a digital future I, I've made part of it already, but really, it really kind of stacks up with this, with the same concept of this whole fintech kind of evolution and transformation that's happening right now where there are so many financial technologies popping up and evolving and emerging, especially over the last couple of years, that it's, it's almost impossible to keep up with. There's so many things happening and really a digital currency future supports uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of these, these moves in this direction. Uh, so certainly that is one major argument for uh, where the future is. Um, so let's talk a bit about investment here. So, you know, I'm certainly not here to tell you whether to or not, or not to invest in, in cryptos. Um, simply because uh, you know there's a lot of you know there's a lot of underlying challenges and it's in, it's an immature market in the sense that we just don't know where it's going. Um, you know I would say you know to make an argument for investing in it, uh, they do represent the future. Uh, I, I really, I mean, can you see us using phys physical currency 25 years out, 50 years out? I, I just can't see that future um, simply because the technology is already there. Um, to, to create that digital future. You already have major government uh, governments like China moving forward with a digital one. You're gonna have the Euro um, move in that direction. There's talk about the digital US dollar. So I, you're already seeing movement in that direction that would suggest that digital is the future. Uh, so certainly that's it. Um, you know, there, there are people that invest to the second bullet here that, you know, the, the way to make money quite often investing and. Is, is to take on risk, right? We talk about this correlation between risk and return. Certainly right now, uh, cryptos are a risky investment um, simply because they are very volatile. And because of that, they offer the potential for high returns, right? And so that is a compelling reason to invest for many people. That's also a compelling reason not to invest for many others that are not looking to take on um, that type and that level of risk, or it really depends on your risk profile of whether or not they make any sense to you. And this last bullet here, I already mentioned other fintechs, uh, fintech advancements that are driving it, uh, including BlockFi, which uh, uh, which is quite interesting as well because it is uh, you know a place where you can buy, sell, but also earn interest on crypto holdings, which is quite uh, quite interesting. So anyway, uh, real quick snapshot of what some of these um, uh, some of these currencies, and I just picked four four of them. Uh, have been doing over the past three months. So these are all three month uh, price charts. And look at Bitcoin. And so even with all the, the press and information that's been kicking around over the last week that, oh my gosh, what's going on with Bitcoin? And, and it was at the end and it's falling and all this stuff. And there's a lot of noise going on out there. If you look at it just over a three month period and you look at the overall trend, th there's not a suggestion here that Bitcoin is falling off the map, right? Now, once again, I'm not suggesting I can predict the future, only that, um, you know, I, I don't think Bitcoin's in any type of dire condition. I also think the interesting thing here to see, and really just looking across three of these charts, which is Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Cardano, if you look at the general kind of shape of these of these uh, curves, they're they're pretty similar, and especially Bitcoin and Ethereum are, are very similar, which would suggest to me right now that people that are trading 
um, these currencies, or whether they're speculating or holding them, whatever they're doing with them, uh, they're, they're actually trading the entire idea, cryptos, even more so than they're trading individual currencies. Uh, because there, there's a lot of correlation between the movements across some of these of these. So it's, it's quite interesting. So where do we go from here? Uh, I say, as I said before, I, I think it's difficult to predict the winners and losers right now. There's a long way to go. Uh, the big, um, you know, gorilla in the room, I guess you'd say, is um, regulatory changes, uh, you know, and how uh, cryptos will be regulated in the future. Uh, certainly, you know, central banks and governments don't like uh, decentralized currencies you know, banging around out there that they have no control over. And so there's certainly going to be some movements there. Um, but there's a there's a long way to go as we look forward. So I guess that's that's the point. So anyway, I'm certainly open for uh, questions, comments, or anything else you might have at this point. All right. Thank you, Peter. Um, like he mentioned, uh, we're open for Q&A now. We've got the Q&A chat box on the right hand side. So we'll give it just a few minutes for folks to type in some questions if you have any. Um, no questions quite yet, but we've got some comments. Folks are very excited to receive the uh, slide deck. So yes, we will be sending that um, along to everyone along with the recording. Um, we've got a few folks that say go, uh, go BlockFi, BlockFi getting looked at closely by regulators. Yeah, that's that. That's the nature of what you can expect in this environment right now. I mean, if you think about it, right? I mean, the 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 launch of Bitcoin back in 2000 really happened outside the scope. I mean, if you want to talk about open market and a free market um, stance here, of course, at, at Northwood. I mean, the, these are these are products, these are currencies that spawned themselves out of the open market, and, and certainly you have many players like BlockFi that are that have come into this in, into the structure now. And, and of course, regulators are always reactive, not proactive. And so quite often, so you're going to see how this plays out, but I think it'll be quite in interesting to see how, how and if regulators can get involved. Now, to, to regulate somebody, a company like BlockFi, I think is a bit different than trying to regulate Bitcoin. And I, I think that's where that dichotomy is going to exist, where we need to figure out how that's going to play itself out. But if you think about it in terms of how the economy in the U.S. has run over years and such, you know, whenever, like now, right, we have inflation that's running rather rampantly, which is not, not surprising. And now the Fed has already come out and started talking about raising rates and trying to control inflation. And how do they do that, right? They do that through policy changes. They do that through limiting, limiting the amount of, of dollars chasing in the market. Well, if you have a whole bunch of decentralized currencies that are the, the mainstay of the market, that starts to take away that lever that, or some of the levers that the Fed has, that the ECB has. So, that scares them. I can assure you of that. So it, the question is, how do they re respond and how do they change? All right. Well, we do have two questions that have been submitted. Uh, first one's from Bitcoin Bro. When are the Bitcoin ETFs supposed to be ruled on? I don't have exact information on when that will occur. And my, my guess is um, that that it will be a little bit, um, it, it's, it's been, I mean, the, if you want to specifically talk about Bitcoin now, right? I mean, some of these discussions have been going on for quite some time. Um, and I really think that there's a bit of, um, I don't want to say confusion. That's not the right word. But I, I, I'm not sure the, the path is clear in terms of, of, of how to do that, when to do that. So I, I think I think you're going to see that play out for a bit. I don't expect you're going to see anything sudden happen anytime soon now. You know, let's just say that inflation keeps running out of control here. I mentioned the whole issue of, you know, obviously governments using monetary policy and such to control things like inflation. Well, if inflation starts running rampant and, and all of a sudden you have a lot of people that are using currencies outside of that structure, um, that suddenly the Fed loses its ability to lever, I think you'll suddenly find that governments are going to be much more inclined to move quickly versus if, if that's not an issue. So it'll be interesting to see as this, this weird place that we are in the economy right now evolves a bit, how this cryptocurrency market moves along with it as. Thank you. All right, another question uh, from David Lee. It's hard to find out which platform to buy from. Where's more info on that? Where can we find more info on that? So I don't know if you're referring to which 
in terms of platform. So meaning that, you know, what digital wallet provider that you would purchase? I'm not sure if that's what you mean by that question. I mean, there's, there's plenty out there. I think if that is what you mean, I think that has been some of the concern and where regulation starts to pop its, you know, its, its ugly head up is in these places where you look at things like Mt. Gox in the past that had a major issue. And there's been other uh, digital coin, uh, digital uh, wallet providers that have had issues, gone bankrupt, all that type of thing, where I, I think that would be a little bit of the concern of, you know, do, how, how do I know which one is a, is a, is a stable company where I can trust, you know, uh, my, my wallet to exist in, in essence, right? Because I would say the advantage right now to, to like the U.S. dollar and such is if, you know, if you're using the U.S. dollar, it, that, that money is deposited in a checking account or savings account somewhere, like let's just use JP Morgan as an example. And, you know, and there is, there is government insurance, the FDIC behind that, right? So you don't have that great concern that if something happens to JP Morgan, that if you have $100,000 in your account, that it's going to disappear. That is not the same right now, right, in, in the digital wallet arena, where if you are investing in, you know, XYZ platform and you, you have their wallet there, if they go belly up next week, you don't exactly have that same type of protection. So that would be interesting to see how regulation starts to play into that area. Um, once again, it gets a bit more complex because these decentralized currencies are global in nature. They're not US based in nature. And so it becomes a bit more challenging to, to deal with that outside of dealing with the individual companies. And I think when we talk about things like BlockFi, Right, that's a company that's doing something. So it's easier to regulate the company being a U.S. corporation and what they can and can't do than it is to try to regulate Bitcoin as a holistic entity. Right, and I think that's where you're going to see some of this play play itself. Right, we've just got time for a few more questions. Um, this is going to get a little personal. Do you own any crypto um, or plan to purchase any? If so, what will guide your personal decision making? I'm almost afraid to say because um, because I don't want to influence people's decision. Yeah, I do. Um, I've been uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum have been two that I've been riding for a bit, um, and I feel quite comfortable comfortable with my uh, investment in Bitcoin. I, I tend to lean toward the perspective that um, uh, that that Fidelity had in the last couple of years that it's going to run up to I don't know about the hundred thousand dollar level, but it's going to run up. Uh, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. The, uh, the other reason is that in an inflationary environment, right, people tend to move their money to safe haven, right? Traditionally, for a long time, one of those safe havens has been gold, and, and it still is, right? When, when people are worried about rampant inflation going on, they tend to pull, they take their cash, and they move it into to what they consider a safe haven, which is gold. You, you could argue that one of the potential long-term places or kind of a, a, a advantages is something like a Bitcoin is a safe haven, right? So realistically, taking cash out if you're if you're afraid. I mean, if, if inflation is going to be running at six, seven, eight percent plus, if you think about it practically, that means that the, the value of the dollar you're holding is degrading. Let's just use the eight percent number by eight percent every year. Well, how do you combat that, right? So there, you have to find a way to combat that. That's where safe havens come in. I think that's a place where you might see upward pressure on Bitcoin and Ethereum and some others because of that. Right, because people are looking for places to go. And if inflation gets even worse, I think the potential for that is even greater. So I see that as well. But, you know, I have been investing in cryptos for the last couple of years. Um, I don't speculate too much in them. When the whole Dogecoin thing was going on, um, you know, some months ago with um, kind of with the Reddit backdrop and then with Elon and all that kind of thing, um, I played it a little bit just, just for fun. And actually, I, I went in one of my classrooms here, I, I did an investment of, of a little bit just so we could use it as a classroom exercise and I could show the students how it was uh, kind of happening or how it was progressing over time over the months in the class so that was rather interesting uh, but I don't I don't get too much in spec into the speculation side of, of this uh, this space because I think it's it's really quite dangerous now it, it, it is very risky and there's a real chance you could lose tremendously if you make the wrong bet cryptos right all right, we're going to wrap this up with just one more question, um, and then there is many other questions beyond this, so we will share these uh, with Professor Bush, and um, I, I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, answer them if they haven't already been answered. 
Um, lastly, can you speak more about smart contacts and their potential? Smart contacts, contracts, maybe? Yeah, well, I, I think I think there's a tremendous amount of potential, but once again, right? So if you want to, so we're talking back to blockchain here and not, not Bitcoin specifically. So the, the, the advantage to, to the blockchain technology is it has the ability to replace a lot of these paper document um, types of structures that exist right now uh, in terms of, I use the mortgage contracts as an example. Um, and so most certainly, it, if you think about the digital age that we're in and the existence of, existence of FinTech and the fact that we all live on our phones, you know, we're in a digital world. It, it seems kind of ridiculous that if you close on a mortgage, you have to go sit at a desk somewhere and, and, and literally sign 50 documents like a giant pile like this. I mean, it, it seems to make no sense. Right? It, it, seemed to make, it seemed to be the perfect place where smart contracts where digital documents can replace that type of, 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 of process, including kind of the digital notary perspective of that. And I think that's true, but keep in mind, right, there, there are a lot of companies that have a lot of lobbying power that don't want that to happen, right? Most, most certainly, I mean, there are, there are companies that make, the title companies, for example, that make money off of, off of that process. You know, it, it's, it's gonna be, so these major hurdles have to get you have to get cleared. I mean, why hasn't there been a comprehensive, I mean, just kind of jump off topic, but why hasn't there been a comprehensive tax restructure in, in the U.S.? Well, you keep in mind, there, there are companies like H&R Block and others that make, make billions off of preparing tax returns. So they, they have no incentive to make it easier for that to occur, right? So that's what you're seeing a bit with fintech right now is that a lot of these fintech technologies, these evolutions, these things are challenging the status quo I can assure you, if you look at some of the other comments from Jamie Dimon over the past two or three years, that there is a, a great degree of nervousness in commercial banking and financial services and a lot of other industries right now, simply because there are technologies coming that have the, the, the potential to replace what they do and to, to shatter their business model. And really, that's what I see. So I think certainly the potential is there now. It's just a matter of time. It's a matter of getting through some of these hurdles. But at the end of the day, it's, it's the customer who's going to decide. There are plenty of smaller companies right now that are offering some of these products out there. And as, as customers flock to them, as, as, um, as uh, citizens put pressure on Congress and others to, to kind of change the game a bit and open the rules up, uh, that's when it'll change. I think it's going to take some time. Well, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like we're going to have to wrap this up, um, but I think we've got enough content to do a part two. So maybe we'll schedule that soon. And um, if you enjoyed the presentation today, it looks like many of you did, um, you can get more of Dr. Peter Bush um, or the rest of our faculty um, at DeVos Graduate School. Um, you'll see this final slide. It looks like he's, they've got six programs, uh, six master's programs, or actually five master's programs and a DBA now. Um, so again, if you're looking for more information on that, um, just go to northwood.edu. Um, and again, thank you to everyone for attending today. Um, thank you to Dr. Peter Bush for um, sharing his expertise with us. And we will be sending the information out um, the slide deck, uh, the recording, and a quick survey uh, to you um, soon. So thanks again, and uh, we hope to see you at our next webinar um, next month in November. Thanks again. Thank you all so much.